Good morning. Good morning, Donna, and um, good afternoon, evening almost for uh, everybody's calling in from, from Vienna or from Austria, should I say. And uh, today is our first webinar in the Go USA Startup Talk series and uh, with the very much awaited uh, topic of state of venture capital and US investment trends. And I am excited to introduce Donna Harris. She's founder of Builders and Baggers. I'll go into her bio real quick so you guys know, or y'all know, um, who you have the pleasure uh, to be listening to this morning. Um, Donna Harris is the founder and CEO of Builders and Backers. It's a venture capital firm and philanthropic initiative which ignites entrepreneurial action and experimentation in communities around the world. She is also a general partner of 1776 Ventures, a Washington DC based venture capital fund born out of the 1776 network of entrepreneurial incubators that she co-founded in 2013. She has investments spanning five continents and the fund invests in young enterprises tackling critical world challenges and building innovations that matter. Harris is also a venture partner at Praxis Labs in New York, where she advises the faith community and the power of redemptive entrepreneurship and investing. Welcome, Donna, and thank you for spending time with us. Can thank you. Hear you. I can. Can you hear me all right? Let's see. You're welcome. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you go a little bit more into what is redemptive, redemptive entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, I that think it, my attention. if you think about investing, oftentimes the business model that we uh, are aware of is, is um, oftentimes can be extractive, right? It, it, it can focus on not necessarily what the business does or who benefits or what the value to society is and more so just very narrowly focused on the financial return. What redemptive investing does is say we want to balance getting venture skill venture returns from the companies we put capital into but we also want to invest in things that make society better and you know whether that's thriving communities thriving societies solving challenges um the the framing of redemptive is a framing simply for faith driven um uh, entrepreneurs and investors but it's very common even outside of faith-based arenas and an increasing number of venture capitalists myself and others are just are focused in on we're going to deploy growth capital let's choose companies that can also make society a better place because there's certainly no shortage of challenges that we could be aiming our entrepreneurial endeavors at so um, whatever lens or, or uh, phrase you want to put on it it, it really is about uh, making VC scale returns and solving meaningful problems in positive ways. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Yes, we do need a little bit more investments in, in, in the things that matter, the things that help, you know, the world become a better place. Uh, sound like Miss Universe right now, but, um, <laughs> uh, and I forgot, of course, to introduce myself and I'll go uh, deeper into that later, but I'm Natasha Chatelaine. Um, the um, project manager for startups at Tech and Innovation at Open Austria, and more about Open Austria towards the end, because we have a lot to share with you. So Donna, let's uh, jump right into it. Um, we've seen the headlines. Slum put startups' fate in hands of all powerful VC insiders, a mass extinction of VC-backed companies, and companies' existing inventors will play the role of God in deciding their fates. These are some of the headlines that we see. Um, it's no secret that um, the venture capital world has taken a little bit of a nosedive, or is it really a nosedive? And um, how can we put nuance or make sense on the sky's falling perspective? Can you go a little bit into that? <laughs> sure. Well, if you... Uh just went based on headlines, you'd want to pick up your entrepreneurial toys and go home because it certainly does not sound encouraging, does not sound promising. And I, I do think, you know, I certainly don't want to come in this call, you know, being rosy, 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 because we do need to be realistic, but we also need to put this in perspective. And I think that's one thing that I'd love for us to go into today. So, you know, one of the things, if I were to give the sort of top line 
too long, didn't read, right? 2021 was an outlier, right? And it was really um, what I'll call venture mania. And it wasn't a one year venture mania. It's been many years of venture mania in the building. And we can talk more about what I mean by that. But, you know, the sort of um, the sky high numbers that we saw in 2021 um, were the outgrowth of a lot of what's happened over the last eight to 10 years. 2022, the first half sort of carried that momentum. I think that if we didn't have the momentum from 2021 going into 2022, it actually would have been a far worse year. 2023, um, this is going to be a year where things are going to be tight. Things are going to be tough. We can talk more about what that means, but it is also a return to healthier investment practices. So, you know, when we think about this, like let's let's put some numbers in context, right? I mean, 2021 was, I think it was a 320, 329 billion worth of investment, right? That's a hard act to follow. So when we look at, you know, 2022 and we say, oh, you know, oh, the, you know, numbers are down, numbers are down, you know, we were down 14% on deal count, we were 30% down on deal value, it was still dramatically better than even prior years, right? So we're, we've got to have some perspective around right. we're comparing 2022 to 2021. 2021 is a very tough act to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, the, the deal speed, there were a lot of venture capital tourists in the marketplace, meaning sort of everybody sort of caught this venture mania. So you saw a lot of non-traditional investors plowing money into the market. Um, mm -hmm. You saw a lot of upstart funds pulling money into the market. And now we're just gonna, we're gonna see a lot of right sizing in 2023, back to, back to diligence, back to standard practices, but there's some nuances in there that I think are really important for anybody who's trying to raise capital that we can dig into. Right, yes, and and that's the, those nuances. And it, well, we'll, we'll definitely um, go into that because there, there were a couple of really interesting opportunities for startups that you had mentioned. Um, do you have an idea of which tranche of companies um, this downturn in, in in investments will will affect the most or downturn you know uh less money or more diligence is there a tranche of companies that will feel or bear the brunt of this yeah there's definitely winners and losers in all of this and that i think continues into 2023 so losers are definitely going to be series c and beyond companies um, you know, it's, it's a, um, these companies have to raise an enormous amount of capital. They're the most starved for capital. It's the stage of capital where investors are pulling back the most. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we saw fewer mega rounds. We're at like three, four year lows on that. So series C, series D going to be tough. Winners actually are seed stage startup. So we look at 2022, and I think this is going to continue into 2023, you know, angel and seed stage investing was actually pretty resilient in 2022. And there were, you know, 7,200 7, deals done in 2022. Um, and, you know, when you think about that from a logical, cyclical perspective, if I put a dollar in a seed stage company today, I'm not really tied to this economic cycle because it's going to take five, seven years mm -hmm. for that investment to be realized. So it's the, it tends to tend to be the most resilient. And if you look at data in terms of fund performance, seed stage funds that are raised and deploy capital following a recession, following the inversion of a yield curve, uh, they actually tend to be the top performing VC funds. So seed mm -hmm. stage is actually an, a, a quite bright spot in this mix with the caveat that mm -hmm. if you look at quarter over quarter numbers, so all four quarters of 2021, I'm sorry, 2022, um, we had four consecutive quarters of declining deal flow, even at the seed stage. So, you know, we can, we can sort of forecast 2023 that's going to likely continue into the quarters of 2023. So capital's still out there, deals are still getting done, but it's definitely a more competitive market and 
how long it takes and the diligence and all of those things um, are different today than they were even a year ago. Okay. Um, so I also want to mention to the audience that you can ask any questions in your uh, questions um, tab um, and we'll try to address them as, as we go. Um, so with that, so the series C and D will suffer most, there will be the losers and seed stage will, will be the winners. Any topic or industry loser winner perspective, because we know, for example, you know, there's been a buzz with uh, generative AI and uh, alternative proteins, both have seen 1.7 billion in, in funding and the alternative protein market is actually had a 68% growth. Mm -hmm. um, probably some of it might be, you know, this whole fear of missing out, the FOMO, um, et cetera. But um, do you see any industry um, that is going to get more attention, less attention? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you nailed, uh, you nailed a couple of them. So AI for sure, um, you know, as much as we as investors like to view ourselves as leading edge thinkers, there is some FOMO that happens uh, in the investing world. And you sort of saw that it's a little bit like um, if you've ever watched um, toddlers play soccer, right? It's a little bit like a clump of people moving up and down the field. And in some cases, yeah. this can be said of investing as well. And we saw that with, um, you know, NFTs, digital currency, right. block, blockchain, Bitcoin, we're now mm -hmm. seeing that within AI. Now, to be fair, it is an enormous frontier for investing. And so I think you are going to continue to see AI, generative AI, being an enormous uh, place for capitals being deployed um, mm -hmm. in 2023 and beyond. Climate tech is another one that mm -hmm. I think is really um, outperforming, going to continue to outperform. So, uh, you know, 2022, if you look just at the solar segment in particular, investment mm -hmm. in 22 was actually 50% greater than 2021. So while the rest of the market was making a nosedive, solar was on the on the upswing. And, and generally, I think all things related to alternative energy, you know, the energy crisis that followed the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we have mm -hmm. the Reduction Act that gives a lot of support to clean energy startups. And so a lot of that will just lead to continuing amounts of capital going into clean tech type companies as well. Okay. And then there's some geographic bright spots as right. well. Think, think of that, yes. So, you know, typically when we think of venture capital, we immediately, you know, hone in on California, New York, Massachusetts, those yes. tend to be biggies. Um, they all saw massive declines in 2022. Interestingly, mm -hmm markets and um, saw a pretty significant jump. So Florida um, saw a huge percentage increase, actually the largest percentage of increase of any state, um, mm -hmm. and North Carolina and then Texas. So, you know, between 2020 and 2021, mm -hmm. Texas capital went up like a hundred and some odd per hundred and five hundred and ten percent. Now last year, you know, Texas startups actually did notably well all things considered. Um, and in particular, like Austin fared very well in the slowdown, comparatively speaking to other okay. communities. It actually scored the second highest mm -hmm. in the amount of venture dollars in local history. So again, this went back to that perspective point. If you just look at the decline, right, you could, you could say, oh, Austin, you know, had a decline in startups. It was a huge slowdown, but a huge slowdown, even though it was the, you know, second highest dollars in history it's still right. a pretty good year. yes have you seen a lot of um movement from startups uh you know seed stage etc people actually i remember you know i moved here in 2007 so 2008 2009 and i'm in in san francisco um it, it felt like the whole world was coming here are you seeing some of that in, in a place like Austin? Does it feel like people are clamoring to move to Austin or I don't know how much experience you have in Florida and North Carolina, but let's uh, skip it to, to, to Austin, Texas. What do you yeah. see? I think a lot of communities, Austin, Miami in particular, you know, some communities in North Carolina, they've been the beneficiary of this COVID migration, right? The, the right. 
COVID taught us all, we don't necessarily all need to be located in the same city. We can be anywhere. And if we can, you know, like our company is a great example. If we can actually have team members remotely located all over the country, including places like Austin, we get the benefit of participating in all of these incredible communities. So, you know, this is why you're seeing an influx of entrepreneurs, an influx of investors, and an influx of startups um, in all of these places. And in particularly in warm weather climates, if you look at the migratory patterns post COVID, mm -hmm. Right, the sort of southern tier of the United States, mm -hmm. which benefits of that. Um, and I think we're only going to see that increase. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I'm, I'm wondering how has um, builders and backers navigated this? Do you have any plans for new funds that are being shelved, or how does it? How how will it translate? In, in, in the big picture to your financial relationship with your portfolio companies. What's going yeah. on there? So let's divide it into, um, because I have two funds under management um, and we're continuing to invest, let's talk about the them in sort of three cohorts. So there's the cohort of uh, portfolio companies that have, for my 1776 fund, are now reaching the sort of end of fund life. So for, if you think about a fund, how funds work, right? Funds tend to have a 10 year life. So they mm -hmm. raise the money that investing, there's an investment period, the beginning of the fund, and then there's a, you know, five, six, seven, eight year period throughout the rest of that 10 year cycle where the companies are growing and then there's an exit at the end of that 10 year, 10 year life. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a number of companies that are in that Series C, D, E, F stage, uh, companies that had just begun to see their breakout growth. So they're impacted differently than the companies that we're currently investing into, which are at that pre-seed, pre seed, really early stage. We're not as worried about the current economic conditions for those companies because we don't expect them to grow until you know seven or eight years from now. Uh, okay. So if we think about that first group, right, those that are in that, you know, they're already in market, they've already been growing. Uh, for them, you know, and all companies of that, you know, all that of that sort of lifespan and life cycle and, and founding stage, the risk is actually quite high of failure in that category of company. If you think about it generally, all, almost half of all VC backed tech companies will need to raise capital within the next year, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, I think there was a survey done a few months ago, four out of five early stage companies actually don't have 12 months of cash runway on hand. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of companies that are stretching their capital, trying to make it you know, last as long as possible, wait out the storm. But there's a flood of companies that are gonna be raising capital in the second half of 2023 and into 2024. And a lot more that will be seeking capital than will get funded. We'll see a lot of down rounds, lots of uncomfortable and ugly terms, um, and some will fail. Um, and so that will be primarily that sort of later stage type company. Um, and mm -hmm. I frankly think that's gonna impact venture capital as a whole. It's why you see headlines, like you said, like an extinction event. This is what we're talking about, right? Because if these, this is where that exit potential, we think about VC like a cycle, we need them to exit to return capital so the funds can prove their returns and go back to the LPs, raise more capital and create that cycle. And so there's this ripple effect of what can happen if a significant proportion of those companies fail. And that can even reach into the pre-seed and seed stages as well. Now the pre-seed and seed stages, I said, you know, they've been very resilient. Right? Founders of, um, you know, we've been seeing fairly resilient deal flow. We haven't been seeing investors pulling back as much from those rounds as we have later stage, but it's it's getting tougher. Right? It's tough out there. So, you know, we've got lots more people raising capital right. than in prior years because mm -hmm. we've got this venture mania that's been going on. So, <laughs> there's if we look today versus ten years ago, you know. They're even like latest data, VCs are seeing about 30% more pitch decks than mm -hmm. they've seen in the past. 
and mm -hmm. we're spending a lot less time on them. So like the, the winnowing of can you get a VC's attention is narrowing. There's a lot more deals chasing capital uh, and fewer deals getting done. Rounds right. are happening, but they're taking longer to finish. We can talk about some of the metrics if it's helpful, but, you know, yeah. fast back reviews, longer fundraising times, it's increasingly competitive and diligence is back in force. So companies mm -hmm. that are, you know, targeting an area where there's proof that somebody wants to buy their product, they have evidence, they need to be much more buttoned down in terms of decks, metrics, you know, deal rooms, and be targeting uh, something that is a core need, right? We've we've sort of returned to a moment of brutal honesty about, you know, mm -hmm. whether or not people want this. We're investing less on the potential for something that might maybe have an upside to where's some evidence, where's traction. Traction is definitely something that's on the rise at this point. So we can dig more into I, any one of any, any and all of that that's useful for yeah, the folks. Definitely. It, it's been a basically self-fulfilling prophecy for better or worse for the investors, right? To they're getting more than they can bargain for now. And now it's you know down to the wire. We have to be much more diligent as an investor uh, nowadays. Can you um uh, uh let's see there was um another question that i had on that you know as a focus on on revenue profitability and and making sure that your company is bringing for the startups or for the for the companies uh, larger companies that they're bringing something of value to the table um as that is becoming the focus on that is becoming sharper um it sounds like companies reliance on venture, venture capital as a uh, panacea to continue to grow or it's just drying up. You have to be prepared for when that pier is coming to an end, that you don't just fall into the water, that you have either enough of a runway or that you're actually making revenue. Um, you had mentioned, uh, it's, been, it's been always kind of this dichotomy between going to a bank or getting grants, especially in Europe. Um, a lot of the startups that we see come here um, from from Austria, um, they've gotten significant uh, grants as as their funding is what they see as, as venture capital or funding. Um, um, but you mentioned uh, an alternative source of funding that you call redeemable equity. Can you go a little bit more into what that is and how that? It doesn't have to be just that. What other examples do we have? But what is this one specifically, and why is it better for startups? How is it good for uh, the whole ecosystem? Well, before we dig into specifically what redeemable equity is, is something that's really important to understand is if we think about, you know, we use the word venture mania. If we think about startup land today. Right. I have an idea. The next thing you do is, is you put a pitch deck together, right? And you start pitching the company. It's all about pitch competition, pitching, raising VC. It's the thing that gets celebrated when you talk about startups. It's all over the news. It's a sexy thing to get venture capital investment. But to be clear, if I'm a founder and I have a company and I own that company, I own the equity in the company. If I choose to take venture capital, I am going down the single most expensive category of capital, right? It is by far and away the single most expensive form of capital you can take as a founder, All right? So if we're stack ranking this from least expensive to most expensive, way up here at the top would be safe notes and convertible notes, <laughs> right? And the, the whole VC category in general. And at the mm -hmm. bottom, guess what's the least expensive? Revenue, revenue is the least expensive. You don't give up any equity. And there are some funding vehicles that you can take advantage of that can help you drive growth, right? So if you are actually already earning recurring revenue, you should be exploring how do you actually um, trade your recurring revenue in these, these upfront contracts for cash flow. Platforms like Pipe allow you to do that where you're not actually giving up any equity in your company. So all of the sort of non-diluted vehicle. So uh, grants would definitely fall in that category. And there's an increasing a number of grants that are out there, as many governments, the U.S. included, uh, at the both federal, state, and local level, have looked at how do we jumpstart more entrepreneurship, 
grants are a good way to do that. So, you know, by all means, explore non dilutive grants for sure. It's something that we provide to idea stage founders mm -hmm. in order to help them get their idea off the shelf. And there are a number of other organizations that provide non dilutive grants as well. Then, if you sort of move up the spectrum, right, there's, mm -hmm. there's debt, there's venture debt. And then there's this category that we've been very interested in and, and are now actively investing um, called revenue, uh, redeemable equity. So mm -hmm. you know, think about it, it's, a, it's somewhere yeah. between equity and revenue-based financing or, or debt vehicles. And it is an, it's an equity investment structured very similar to you know, making a traditional VC investment in your company, but mm -hmm. there's an agreement where the founder um, can re can sell back, agree to buy back, or you know redeem the shares over time through dividends that are tied to cash flow. So it's a very so much a blended model between traditional equity vehicle and something that's more tied to revenue. So as the company grows, the founder isn't necessarily tied to the amount of equity that they gave up mm -hmm. at those stage there's optionality there so they can buy um, most not all of those shares back and from our perspective it allows us to widen the lens of the kinds of companies that we deploy capital into those that aren't necessarily um, heading for a major exit or frankly if the you know exit window doesn't open up gives us optionality for getting return back to our investors that isn't tied to the exit market which right now is not not in a great place. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I was going to ask why would a VC want want that, but that makes sense then. Okay. Um, and how? What's the percentage of uh, of companies so far um, that have made use of this re redeemable um, equity with with building vehicles? So we're excited to get rolling and begin deploying that with invest with uh, entrepreneurs. So. Um, and uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, one of our partners, Jonathan, uh, is somebody who's an expert in this and would be happy to do a follow-on webinar just specifically on what this is and how it works and all the ends and means. But, you know, we're very interested in, you know, let's sort of remove the venture capital myopia, right? We're sort right. of very focused on VC, VC, VC. Venture right. capital in its, is an appropriate vehicle for some startups, not all. And I feel like we've sort of forgotten the, the, the honest conversation amongst ourselves as to which companies really are appropriate for VC because it's sort of become the default. So we're on a mission to sort of put VC back in its right place um, and make sure we have a full, full stack of funding vehicles. Because if I'm an entrepreneur listening to this webinar, I'm nodding my head vigorously, but I'm also saying, where are these other funds? Right, and so it's really um, up to investors like me and communities and, and other investors to say, wait a minute, let's experiment with some of these other options mm -hmm. so that we fund the full range of entrepreneurial ventures, not just the 1% at the top that's VC right. approved. So you mentioned that, you know, VC, the, 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 the top, a very expensive venture capital is, is only for very specific companies. Can you go in a little bit which companies, the profile of a company that's perfect for this very expensive uh, yeah, way of funding? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that um, I'm always amazed by is um, when I talk to founders about why they want to pursue venture capital and what do they know about the way VC firms work, what we're accountable for, what we have to deliver to our investors. They, they don't actually know a lot about that. And mm -hmm. when we go into the economics, right, how do we actually provide a return? Because people mm -hmm. give us their money. Those are called limited partners. They give us their money. We invest that money in companies. And we primarily benefit from the upside. So if that money you know, doubles in value or triples in value or whatever. And so from a very simple metrics, you look at that and you say, yeah, if you can triple or quadruple your money, that's fantastic. But you have to keep in mind that a third of the companies we invest in are going to fail completely. So that money is flushed down the toilet. A third mm -hmm. of the companies will barely return what we gave them. So one X, I give you a hundred, you give me a hundred back. That means a third of the portfolio not only has to make up for all that, they have to provide 
all the returns for me to get my return target back to my limited partners. And my limited partners are saying, if I could put the money in the stock market or in the S&P 500, I'm gonna get this level of return, very you know lower level risk. So I'm expecting significantly higher returns than what I could get elsewhere. Well, to hit those significantly higher returns, mm -hmm. when we're deploying capital, we have to see the ability to have a 10X minimum increase in our investment. So you immediately start doing the math and you know very simplistically, you know, if I invest in your company today and has $2 million in revenue and I need to see a 10X growth in order for that company to be worth, you know, the, the value that I need to make my return, I need to see that you can grow that 2 million company into a company of $50 million in revenue in, you know, let's call it five years, minimum, minimum. So that means you need to be in a massive market. It needs to be a growing market. It needs to be a market where there isn't existing competition, where there's a very clear, large market opportunity for me to go in and capture, or ideally a brand new market that I can own. I need to see that you're going to the number one or number two in that market. I need to see that you have a strategy, you have a unique enough product that you can do that. Competitive advantage, some kind of a moat to keep, not only get you the competitive advantage, but keep you there long-term. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I need to see that you're the team that can execute that, right? So it, you put all that together and there's some fantastic companies out there, but they just don't fit that bill in terms of market size or, the potential to be one or two in the market and, and all those dynamics or, or they're going to grow, but they just can't grow that quickly mm -hmm. or they can't that big. And that's, there's, that's not a knock on those businesses. All that is saying is there's, this is not the form of capital for you. There's a different form, form of capital for you. Exactly. Okay. Very clear. Because I think a lot of times uh, these startups, they think, Oh, if we didn't, if we didn't raise funding, then, you know, we're going to pull out completely or, we're just gonna kind of bear down and, and and not go with it. But it's good to hear that there are options um, for them to get funding that is outside of what you know this venture mania that we've been hearing about. We do have a, an audience question, which is interesting here. Um, the question is, what would be your advice to a seed stage company or seed stage startup looking to fundraise in the current economic climate? Yeah, such a great question. So, um, you know, I would say there are two things that I would ask you to talk to yourself about before you jump in. And then there's a host of things I would tell you once you jump in. So um, first things is that, you know, generally in a recessionary moment, you wanna get super creative. So one is make sure you're solving a problem that people are really truly willing to pay for. Um, even when their budget is tight, right? So this is the moment where um, products that are absolutely necessary versus things that are nice to have um, are the things you want to be focusing on. Um, the second is that, you know, being frugal. So how much you decide to raise, what you're going to use that money for, we want you to be incredibly frugal about that um, and be very milestone driven. So you know, what is it you are going to achieve with raising that capital, making sure that you raise enough to get you there to have the runway, um, but not spending on anything that isn't absolutely incredibly critical. And then second thing is to ask yourself, just based on what we just talked about, be brutally honest about whether your business is indeed VC appropriate, because this is the moment where, you know, VCs are pulling back. So if you're not squarely in that sweet spot, in that target zone, right? The target zone has gotten super small. It used to be this, now it's this. So you gotta be in that target zone for sure to be successful. Um, if you decide that it's a yes and you wanna move forward and you, you're all green lights, yes, I wanna do this, then I would say first things first is your pitch deck has to be absolutely incredible. And here's why. Your VCs are gonna spend about two minutes and 43 seconds, I think is the latest data on how much time a VC is going to look at your deck. So, you know, we're seeing, as I said, 30% more decks than we were seeing a year ago. So, you know, I'm seeing more decks and I'm spending less time on them. And here's the part of the deck that has to be excellent. Your traction slide, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely critical, right? Because it used to be that VCs spent a lot of time looking at product, 
slides, a lot of time looking at the business model slide. Now the number, the you know, thing that really is the most significant thing that VCs are paying attention to is traction. What's your, what's your traction? Um, and in fact, among the companies that did not get funding, it's the number one thing that was the most scrutinized in those decks. There's a really good um, study from DocSend that you can dig into that, that really goes into that. So, you know, how do you have traction when you're a pre-seed company? Um, that's sort of the, you know, the dilemma. And one of the things that we advocate for at Builders and Backers is any startup can have traction doesn't necessarily mean you have sales, but you can run low failed experiments so that you can have evidence that the market does indeed want the thing that you have built, right? And so, yes, do your discovery. Yes, go and, and you know, surveys, whatever else you need to understand the market, but you can run low fidelity experiments so that your deck can show me as the investor evidence as opposed to guesses. I think, I will, I believe, we might. Right, you can actually move to here's what we did, here's what happened, and now I just need to pour some fuel in to get to the next stage. Um, and then, you know, I think post raising, you know, cash is king, right? You got to really, really manage that cash. So, you know, it's it's survival focused as opposed to valuation focused. So, get in, get the money raised based on an evidence driven deck and then use it to be incredibly scrappy um, and very milestone driven. Thank you for that. Um, the, it's, so what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is basically kind of the end of the Googleization of startups with the chef cooked meals and you know, all the, all the, because you saw that a lot of the startups, they went from, I guess because there was so much money too, they went from the scrappy kind of the basement of your mom or the garage to these world-class, I mean, gorgeous offices, all these nice extras to, to lure the best of the best. It looks like now we have to focus on the things that really matter um, as it always should have been. I wonder if that also, I wonder if that also played a part in, um, a lot of uh, these, these startups and companies just not making it by spending a lot of money on maybe fluff. Well, here, here's the thing. I think um, because capital was so abundant, right? Mm -hmm. Weren't as focused on runway, right? How long, so if you go and you raise a round, how long is that capital going to last you? What's your burn rate? What are you spending that money on? We were less focused on the length of that runway because we knew if you raise a seed right today, you could go raise the you know seed two, six, mm. eight, nine months from now. Now you know you should be you, you need enough capital in the bank to get you you know ideally through 2023 and 2024. As I mentioned, it's going to be a tough market as these companies that need to now go raise additional capital come back to get that capital to stay in business. So you know running out of money is it's fatal, right? Like, and I think a lot of companies um, too late focused on burn rate, too late started cutting, so, you know, maybe cut a tiny little bit around the edges, but I mean, you got to cut down to muscle at this point. I mean, you got to be right, very, very lean, um, less worried about valuation and more worried about staying in business, right? And And being able to do and get done what you need to do. Now, for companies that do that well, this is a phenomenal moment because a lot of your competitors are gonna go out of business. So mm -hmm. you can focus on unit economics, maybe more so than growth. Yeah. Get yourself on a pathway towards profitability. Give yourself optionality. You can play your cards right, you can go on the offense, right? It's the best time to build and make and get market share when your competitor and, you know, in retreat. Exactly, right. There's a silver lining also. And then we have one more question and I'll try to translate it. Um, the question is, does the pitch deck count more than the product really? So I guess the person is, is asking, my understanding of the question is, um, is it more important that you're during the, the pitching or in the pitch deck that you convince the investor of the probability or the opportunity rather than actually um, having 
a, a product that is uh, already has significant traction is 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 that do I have it right, Daniel? <laughs> Basically, the, it says here that it's a follow-up question to what um, Donette said. So, does the pitch deck count more than the product? Yeah, I mean, here's I'll talk about the reality because the reality is I think different than maybe a lot of us wish it was. Right? The reality is you're not going to get the meeting in most times unless the pitch deck sells it. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean. I'm by no means, you know, a global brand like, you know, A16Z or whatever. And I still get 10 to 20 pitches a day sent to me a day. So you think about that. And I have a, I have a job to do in addition to right, reviewing all those decks. And so the amount of time that you can spend looking through that information is not a lot, unfortunately. So the pitch deck mm -hmm. has become the on-ramp for you know, needing investors and getting the capital that you need. So unfortunately, yeah, it matters a lot. Now in that deck, you wanna tell a story, right? And the story is this, this is a massive market and there is a gigantic open hole in this market that is ripe for somebody to drive a Mack truck through and go capture it. And oh, by the way, that hole is growing fast, right? That's, you got my attention. Now, here's what's, here's my solution and why that is novel. And why it's so novel, I have a competitive advantage and a moat around my business, right? So if you think about like a castle with a river around it, a moat around it to protect the castle, right? What is new and novel about your idea and why is that completely differentiated from anything else that is out there? Okay, now you've really got my attention because I go, oh, if you could build that, it could go capture that market. Now I'm intrigued. Okay, now do you have the chops to build this? Who, who's behind this? What's your thinking? And the deck is, um, so it's an appetizer. It's not the main meal, right? So your appetizer is to whet my appetite for me to go hey let's let's hop on the phone and let's drill in that mm -hmm. call is where you're gonna sell product. why is it so unique why is it so novel and why is there a huge market for it and why are you the people uniquely equipped to go make this happen mm -hmm. yep okay awesome um let's see do i have more questions i have two more quick questions um so then with all that said and all that information any industries that you would say mm, don't go into that right now um i am not industry cautious okay. um, i think there's a lot of me to startups out there and not necessarily having honest conversations with themselves about what's truly unique, right? Mm -hmm. So being less expensive than the competition isn't a lasting competitive advantage, right? So something truly novel and truly unique about what it is you're doing and not just in terms of legacy competition, but you know, poke your head up out of your own local ecosystem and find out who else is building the same thing you're building because as VCs, we get pitches from all over the world. You know, the number of times we say to ourselves, oh, we've seen 27 pitch decks of X idea, right? So um, making sure it's, I mean, for, for me, it's really about the market size and what's new and novel. And I think at this unique moment where sort of the entire world is becoming digital and that presents an enormous number of opportunities even in markets that might necessarily not appear to be sexy or appear to be cool or you know, sort of right for disruption. When you overlay AI, you overlay technology, you overlay some clean tech technologies, modern tools and tech, there's an, a lot of opportunity to dislodge the incumbents in those markets. And we're, as society, I think in a place where we have monopoly fatigue. So you look mm -hmm. at a lot markets and go why are there only one or two big players like it's, is there an opportunity to do something completely different and customers are, re are ready for it so mm -hmm. timing is everything right, as well 
Right. And and there's this uh, follow-up question, which, you know, has a, a winky face at the end, but I still, so I guess it doesn't really need an answer, but I think it's still good to mention it because that it gives an idea of um, the mindset that has been uh, growing around this whole VC ecosystem. And it is, so we have to spend more money on the pitch deck than on the product. We have to spend more time and be more diligent on, because if you can pay anyone to make your pitch deck or if that's what they're meaning. But and let's be clear, um, I'm not saying when I say have a good pitch deck that the emphasis should be on design. Exactly. Right? Because, and, and I'll say a lot of founders make the mistake of saying, oh, I need a pitch deck, let me go hire a designer. Exactly. Hiring a designer is optional and should be the last thing that you do. So let's back this up. First of all, a good pitch deck starts with a good story. And a good story starts literally with this, right? Mm -hmm. Or a doc or some, whatever your medium of choice is. Mm -hmm. Literally, if you cannot take, you know, 10 yeah. three by five cards or 10 sticky notes and write the flow of your story down in concise mm -hmm. form, mm -hmm. no amount of graphic design is not is gonna it's not going to help you make a great pitch deck. She's going to be a pretty deck, but that's not a good pitch deck, right? A good pitch deck tells me the story. And some of the some of the companies that have gotten great amounts of funding have really ugly pitch decks, but it's because mm -hmm. they're hitting the right notes with the story. That's point number one. Point number two is Canva. Canva, Canva, Canva. You can make an amazing, beautiful deck in Canva. So once you've done this, open Canva, and use one of their many thousands of templates and make yourself a beautiful document. And by the way, Canvas free to start with. Exactly. There you go. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Donna, for your time with us. Thank you for the incredible insights. I've learned a couple of things here and there. Um, and I'm sure the audience also has learned a lot. Um, I wish there were more questions, but I'm sure they'll wait until... <laughs> Uh, the end and we'll get uh, emails and this is recorded so we will um, share that uh, on our LinkedIn on our website we'll send you a copy also um, and uh, this is the opportunity now for me to talk a little bit about Go USA because this is a, a webinar series that we're doing for a Go USA um, uh, startup boot camp really um, and we will go through it, introduce Open Austria a little bit, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is Open Austria here in San Francisco, and it's um, the two of us, Daniel, who's the Austrian Trade Commissioner, and myself, and I manage innovation startups and tech here in San Francisco in the western part of the, of the US. Um, we were founded in 2016 and located at Galvanize. And our focus is different than other offices all around the world. We focus because of our location on tech, innovation and startups. Um, so if you are a startup that has a desire to come to um, Silicon Valley, it can be Austin, it can be you contact us here at Open Austria. Um, for the Go USA 2023, um, it's our base care startup boot camp of about two weeks of hands-on instruction, we call it, and then two weeks of co-working. And these are some of the parties that have gone through. These are some of the Austrian startups that have gone through our um, program over the past 15 years. Over 200 startups, some of the names you might recognize. And this year, our new location is Austin. So we're really excited about that. And that's why we um, engage with Donna. Um, and for the future, you can see we have Arkansas on there for retail and retail tech. And this year, or 2022 rather, uh, was go New York, go Boston, and go Silicon Valley. Go Silicon Valley for the longest time up to uh, 2021 was the only location. So we are glad to be expanding and capturing some of the the new hotspots that Donna was talking about. We have to figure out what's in North Carolina that's interesting um, for our Austrian uh, um, partners, and also of course Florida. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is basically what the program will look like. We aim on 20 startups across the three locations. 
and the program is four weeks in person. If you're chosen, you actually come physically to, in this case, Boston, Austin, or San Francisco, and you have two weeks of hands-on um, instruction with our partners um, and with a demo day where you are pitching in front of these VCs. Uh, I guess we're contributing to this VC mania, aren't we, Donna? <laughs> A little bit, a little bit. No, no, no. But now we have uh, partners that can help you um, find different uh, sources of funding, so you don't have to go for the very expensive um, funding. And we have to say also that we all, always try to be brutally honest to the startups that come to our program and steer them to or advise them in such a way that they choose what is right for them. So they decide that, hey, you know, right, it's right now. It's not the right moment for us to pick up funds from a VC, or we'd rather keep looking for, um, um, I don't know, uh, grants back home or elsewhere than by all means. So we, you don't have to leave um, the boot camp and have you know, secured a VC or VC funding. That is not the aim. The aim is to grow and really find whether your part market fit and whether you're ready to scale in the US or um, if Europe is a better, better um, place for you to grow. Um, we have the incubator space where you can stay at. There will be a networking event and we'll introduce you um, to our networks in the locations. And of course, there'll be a mentoring program where you have a mentor to work with one-on-one. -on -one. And um, I hope I don't um, <laughs> uh, just uh, come in and, and put you on the spot, Donna, but we hope that we can work with you as one of our, our mentors uh, down the line. Um, we can go to the next slide. So this is the timeline. Um, basically, uh, the application period is open until uh april 16th and we will have a pitch day in front of our partners on may 18th and the winners are going to be announced at the startup world cup in austria and between june and september you'll be working with your chosen mentors um, all the way up to actual boot camp day uh, and in between, we'll also have what we call a, um, it's a, an onboarding masterclass. Um, we held that in Vienna last year, where we will bring our partners to Vienna and you'll have about three days, kind of like a, an intro to, okay, what do you need to be prepared for in the US? What is specific to your location? What does your deck look like? What are your options in, in, in funding, cultural differences, et cetera, et cetera. And then September is uh, when the programs uh, start and Boston, San Francisco and are going to be kind of overlapping. And Austin will be in October in connection with Austin Startup Week. Uh, San Francisco will be in connection with TechCrunch Disrupt. Um, so these are the things that you can um, focus or expect to that we're going to be focusing on during the Go USA Bootcamp. You know, you get investor ready, you test whether you're ready for the US market, you find some strategic partners, or you decide during you know your time here that maybe we're not ready for the US market or Europe is better for us. Like I said before, and um, well, you can read all that yourself. But the most important is the target groups are for early stage startups. And we focus on uh, MedTech for Boston, digital tech, uh, sustainable tech, and the business model doesn't need to be, um, uh, it's, it's kind of like a duh, it has to be scalable. And of course, please be interested in the US market. Don't just use it as um, kind of want to just dabble or just participate for fun. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of long days, um, long nights, etc. cetera. Um, and this is the organizing team. Daniel will take um, uh, ownership of Austin. I'll be in San Francisco and Victoria, our New York colleague will be organizing the Boston um portion of the go usa and if you have questions you can email us at the emails that you see uh, on the bottom of the of the slide and i think this is the last is this the last slide daniel i think it is um oh okay a couple of observations uh, that we saw we got less 
less and uh, the smaller number of applications uh, last year could also have had to do with you know the whole pandemic um, but the quality and the maturity of the startups uh, in Austria it, it was really impressive what we um, received as far as um, the founders especially in, in New York and Boston um, the ones in San Francisco were great too uh, I have to <laughs> mention that um, but um, there is there is increased uh, interest now in medtech and, and fintech, and they've been quite impressive. Um, a question that we're getting often from authors: Why do we have to, you know, go to to Silicon Valley or New York? There's so many other places now that are offering some kind of boot camp or program. Um, so there, you know, of course, go to the one that fits best with you. Um, but know that on the ground here, if that's important to you, you have a team that understands culturally where you're coming from and the language you're speaking, not specifically the German only, but also just where is a question coming from. And a promise of investment is, it's, it's a double-edged sword. How? Because a lot of people, think that because we said we introduce you to uh, investors that you will walk away with investments also. That is definitely not the promise that we're making because the work still has to be done by you as the, um, as the startup in, in getting those, leveraging the connections that you make. Um, I will wrap up here with the presentation. There are there's one more question that we um, want to ask Donna um, here. It says, as you said, it will be difficult to raise capital this year. Is this just a cycle that ends at the end of the year and next year there will be more capital available or is this a constant trend? So I guess, will, it be, will, will this be like this forever? I mean, actually, no. If you look at how much capital is sitting on the sidelines, right? Ironically, last year was a record year for venture capital firms to raise capital themselves. So there's actually a lot of capital sitting in VC funds to be deployed. And remember, I said it's a 10 year span where the, and funds have to deploy that capital usually within the first two to three years of their life cycle. Mm -hmm. So Here's the $50 billion question. Will they deploy all that money quickly or will they take the full three years to deploy that capital? Because they technically can sit on it for a little while before they have to deploy that. And ironically, many of the funds that raised the year before that have already deployed their capital because they actually deployed it really quickly because the markets were hot. So money went out the door and now money is sitting on the sidelines. So we're in a bit of this glut in between um, so yes, money will flow. The question is, how soon will those coffers get unlocked? That's the the unknown. Okay, awesome. We have one more quick, 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 quick question. Is it easier for investors to just watch a two-minute pitch video if you're spending an average of two minutes and forty-three seconds, anyways, on reading a deck? That's a question. Um, I I can only speak to my personal preference. My personal preference would be to get a deck. Uh, because I want to think about what you put on the slides and how the story fits together. And I think oftentimes if you're giving a pitch, I'm hearing you verbally, but I'm not getting a lot of the detail that I might be getting in a slide deck. Right. Awesome. And by the way, a 10 slide deck can also include some appendices if you would like the story to be more than 10 slides so that I can scan through those 10 slides. But I would recommend just literally having it be an absolute amazing 10 slide story to pique my interest and then get on a live phone call. Awesome. Thank you so much, Donna. It's Thanks been a pleasure. Me. You're yeah, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Questions, they're feel free to reach out on me on Twitter. I'm uh, D Harris in DC and uh, happy to answer any more questions anybody has uh, virtually. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you audience for uh, being in the audience with us and listening to our first um, webinar. And there are a couple more coming. Please uh, follow our LinkedIn and we will see you at the next webinar. Thank you.